Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Well, what have you say has been in America for a couple of weeks now. We've been trying to understand the experience of working within the US economy. Here's how we got on. Chicago was one of the industrial powerhouses which took US manufacturing and the US economy to the top of the world. And while it still has the largest single workforce in America, recent years have seen the manufacturing sector contract. Barack Obama's repeatedly said during this campaign that he doesn't just want to create jobs, he wants to create skilled, well-paid jobs. And nowhere is that ambition being put to the test more than in the city where he made his name as a politician. And inside one machining factory on the outskirts of Chicago, there are some signs of a recovery. Acme Industries is looking to take on more staff, and its president, Guy Cassidy, sees this as evidence that American manufacturing does have a big future. I anticipate we're going to see a greater amount of manufacturing done here in the U.S. for two reasons. Number one is I think that manufacturing is there's going to be a greater need to have manufacturing done close to where the customer is. Number two is, is the increasing technology that we're bringing into manufacturing every day makes us far more productive. So good news in this factory, but you might be surprised to know that when we spoke with staff here, they told me that hiring people to join them has not proved so easy for Acme Industries. Despite the millions of Americans who are unemployed, some vacancies do remain open. We are looking for people that uh, come on board with a specific skill set. Try, you know, they have to be able to work on the machines right when they walk in the door. So they have to be computer literate. Um, they have to be mechanically inclined. Also, have a great mechanical aptitude. Um, and unfortunately, it's it hasn't been that easy. In all of the places we've visited, we've met people who have complained that there are some young people who are just not prepared to do certain types of work anymore. Donna has worked in manufacturing for years, but it seems her kids are not so keen. I think my son and his friends really don't want to get their hands dirty. I see the people around here ready for retirement. There's a lot of gentlemen out there that are extremely knowledgeable but they are ready to retire. We have no one to fill their space. The issue of finding enough skilled workers for manufacturing remains unresolved, but there was an undoubted confidence at Acme that their factory and their sector will flourish. And that confidence rests in the belief that made in America still means something around the world. I think I have a lot of pride and the products that this country makes and has the ability to make. I, I realize there are a lot of products, electronics and whatnot, that pretty much don't have a place in this country anymore. That's not to say that they can't in the future, but I mean, I, I, I believe America in general makes, makes a lot of high quality products and I think the people here are very proud of the products they manufacture. Chicago and the rest of Illinois are likely to support President Obama in this election. But whoever wins, they may be severely restricted in what they can do about the biggest single threat to US manufacturing, and that's China. American workers have long seen jobs and business heading the way of Chinese factories, and there are many frustrations. I drove out to the suburbs of Chicago to hear some of them. We as American workers, we're not against free trade. I mean, we're, 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 we're based on this. We're a capitalist society. We're based on this. You know, so we have no problem with anybody making profits and earning money, you know, but we just ask that the uh, playing field be level. You know, we, we ask that the same standards and regulations that we are held to stand up to, that they also are too. That way that when we go, you know, to bid for certain jobs, you know, we have just as much a chance at it as they do. While Illinois may well go blue in this election, if you drive east across Indiana, you'll reach Ohio, perhaps the most important swing state of them all. And both candidates are spending a great amount of time and money putting their side of things to voters. One of them is Skip Jones, a turkey farmer whose profits have been hit by escalating fuel costs. And he likes Governor Romney because he believes the challenger will cut taxes and help small businesses to get going. America wants to work. Period. That's what the American people are all about. They love working. And that's why this country was built as quickly and 
Look at what we've done uh, in America. I mean, my God, we've gone everywhere. The moon, well, we can't do that anymore. Too expensive, I guess. But now if people want to work and they want to realize something. They want to realize that, you know, what their future is. And they want a good future and they'll get it. Anybody can do it. You can do anything in this country. It's just work. But they have to have that opportunity. Now, with all due respect to Skip, his farm is small scale. For some of his friends who operate hundreds and hundreds of acres, business has been pretty good during the Obama years. Everybody needs to eat in the world. China, just uh, tremendous, our biggest importer of all grains, corn and soybeans, pork, chickens. Japan is a great importer of our beef, which I grow beef. So the last three, four years have been very good for me. Do you give President Obama some credit for that? Yeah, I guess I could, and the, and the, and the Congress. A long way from the farms of Ohio, a version of modern America is being prepared for the world's consumption. There's plenty of information about the state of the US economy in the mainstream media here. Also on social media, lots of Americans are sharing their experiences of the economic downturn on Twitter and Facebook. But where you're unlikely to find a great deal of information about the reality of how the economic downturn is affecting Americans' lives, is it the TV shows and the films that are made here in Hollywood? A group of actors and film and TV professionals joined me on a suitably swanky roof terrace for a radio edition of World Have Your Say. And when I suggested that the downturn hasn't really made it onto the big or the little screens, I was given quite a few well-meaning looks as if to say, who would watch that? Well, Hollywood and the film and, enter and entertainment and television business is first and foremost a business, and I think you're foolish to think anything more than that. But I do think as storytellers we have a responsibility to show people and show the world and depict the world as it really is as much as we can when we can. You may have an idea that L.A. life delivers cars, pools and fine dining, and no doubt there is plenty of that, but for every working actor there are several more waiting for a call, and the downturn is definitely making itself felt. They see people laid off, they see downsizing, they see demands made of them that ordinarily wouldn't have been made because they, they know people won't say no. They see salaries reduced. You don't have agents now who are walking in and saying, my client has to have $4 million and two trailers and five first-class tickets. Right now, they're grateful to have a job. All that said, and despite the odds, this city still offers a dream that many people find hard to resist. It definitely rewards hard work. It's a marathon, not a race. I have came out here with 15 people. Three of them are still here, and two of us are working. So that's the reality of it. It's staying in the race. We drove south from Los Angeles towards San Diego. The US military is one of the country's biggest employers and hundreds of thousands of its personnel are stationed in Southern California. Just a few miles from a military base called Camp Pendleton is a farm that's run by Colin, who's a former Marine, and his wife, Karen. I've been struck on this trip how few Americans mention Iraq or Afghanistan. But when I told that to Colin, he wasn't surprised at all. I don't think the average taxpayer has a clue about what we do, the amount of responsibility that's pushed on the individual riflemen and what they're out there experiencing. Um, so, you know, everybody says, thanks for your service. And in, in those respects, yeah, I feel supported, but do, does the work we did, we have done feel appreciated? No, it's almost like designing the nicest computer, but not showing it to anybody and not putting it on the retail shelf. For some Americans, the military is an attractive option because it offers a stable job. But is that a good enough reason to join up? If it's just a paycheck, then I would tell them not to. I mean, I th think you have, to be in, you have to understand the world in which we live in and the direction that the Defense Department and the World Defense Department is going to play in that. And if you're not willing to um, serve in horrible places and you're not willing to be gone from your family months or years at a time and, and, and work very hard if it's just a paycheck, I think that's the wrong motivation. 
Jobs in the military come in many, many forms. Brian Myers was part of a bomb disposal team, and earlier this year he lost a hand and a leg while doing his work in Afghanistan. No one I'd met in these two weeks can have taken a harder decision to accept a job, and I wanted to understand why he did it. Because the risk of injury and death is so great, if you are okay with that, and you're content with your mortality, and you're, you've analyzed you know, what your possible capabilities are gonna be, if you lose your legs or you lose your hands or whatever, then it's not hard at all to do your job. I had had a lot of guys that had come before me that had lost their legs and various other appendages, and they were doing great. So, and I told them before I left on the deployment that I actually lost my leg and my hand on that, you know, that they, they put me at ease. And then I was able to fully focus on the job and, you know, and not be scared. And let me tell you, when it does go wrong, you don't feel it. It just, what happened? And then, you know, the pain comes later. We had planned to visit the New York Stock Exchange to speak to some bankers. But Hurricane Sandy put pay to that. We did, though, spend time with one group of workers who it's really hard to miss as you travel this country. Some industries in America really transcend the work that they do. We're in Ontario in California now. It's just east of Los Angeles. And these huge, shining juggernauts and the men and women who drive them are really as much a part of US culture as they are the US economy. And because of the work that truckers do, when you talk to them about how they're faring financially or about how they're feeling, they can really help you understand how well America's working. You have so long to be from point A to point B. You have so many hours in the day you can drive. You uh, have to work enough to make enough money to make ends meet. And you have to do all this without running over the silly person in front of you that hits his brakes at the wrong time. Most of the truckers we met in Ontario seem to like their work and feel proud of it. But they did seem far less convinced that other Americans feel that way. They want their stuff and they want it delivered on time, but they don't want to see you. You're an eyesore. They don't want to hear your truck running and they don't want, you know, your diesel parked on their street, taking up all their parking spaces. So it's, uh, for the most part, people don't think about it. And it's a very give me my stuff and now get out attitude. We're, we're very much underappreciated. I think the industry in the United States has been healthy from 30 years ago to now. Um, our interstates are the veins of our country. Our trucks are the blood cells. We, we deliver the nutrients all the way across the nation and to other parts of the world. We're what makes this country run. We run it from East Coast to West Coast. What have you say, his time in America is ending here in Boston. And I suppose at the end of any journey that we go on, you reflect on the places you've been and the people that you've met. A couple of things really strike me from the conversations I can remember in Chicago with machine workers to farmers in Ohio and actors in Los Angeles. And it's that there's an incredible amount of optimism about how the US economy can grow in the months and years to come. But when you talk to people about that optimism, actually, their confidence is in American individuals and companies being able to help this economy to flourish again. Talk to them about Washington, and they are far less optimistic that the decisions taken there will really have any impact on their working life. And one other thing that I would mention is that whether it's talking to people here in America or looking at all the contributions that those of you around the world have been making as we've broadcast these series of programs, actually, the excitement and the animation has come when we've been talking about the US economy and the experience of working within it. Talk to people about the presidential election, and perhaps they're not quite so passionate, perhaps not quite so animated. And that suggests to me that the idea of America and the American dream remain as powerful as they've ever been, while perhaps the pressures that are coming to bear on the economy and on the political system engage people far less. Well, we hope you enjoyed watching that film. If you'd like to give us your response to it and some of the conclusions that I was drawing 
at the end. You're very welcome to get us at facebook.com slash world have your say and also tweeting using the WHYS hashtag. And actually today is unusual because we're not just doing our usual hour at this time on BBC World News. In just under nine hours we're going to be beginning a special edition of World Have Your Say live here in Boston at the Old South meeting house. Hundreds of Americans are going to be joining me and the team to answer questions that are being recorded by World Have Your Say viewers all around the world. So if you'd like to be involved in that process or you'd just like to watch, just want to watch, turn on in just over nine hours. But if you'd like to post a question, of course, you can do that through Facebook and Twitter. But we've got a new video uploader. If you go to World Have Your Say, Dot com. You'll see the instructions. It's incredibly easy to do from a phone or a computer. And the more questions you get, the more answers we'll have as well. Well, let me introduce you to two people who have joined me here in Boston. We have Bruce Spitzer, who's from the uh, Bankers Association of Massachusetts. Bruce, thank you very much you indeed. Very much. And Gene Horseman is the CEO of a company based here in Massachusetts which promotes small business around the world. Now, uh, one conclusion I drew at the end of that film was that there was lots of optimism in America, but hardly any of it seems to find its foundation in what Washington, D.C. can do about the economy. Do you think I got that right? I think it's a particularly American trait to be optimistic if you're a citizen of this country. What we're concerned about as, as the Bankers Association is um, a lack of optimism among the business community. Um, the business community doesn't like uncertainty and there is some uncertainty about what's going to happen next with this economy. So um, optimism is a great thing. We generally see it, uh, but there is still some concern. Well, at Interice, we work with small businesses, 92% uh, of which are either women-owned, minority-owned, or in lower-income communities. So uncertainty has been sort of a regular reality for them their whole business life. What we're hearing is um, a wariness about encumbering themselves with debt, which is one of the things that's making the, we think, makes the recovery much slower. You probably know in the United States that small business is the job creation engine for the country, and the speed at which jo small businesses are creating net new job growth is a big determinant in the recovery. So maybe the government rather than banks should be the ones helping small businesses to get the capital they need to start rolling. Does that make sense? Well, it's very interesting. There's plenty of money to borrow if you're a small business. Uh, our banks are lending, but loan demand is down, as Gene was talking about, because of that uncertainty. If you're a small business person, you are a small business person first, before you're a Democrat or before you're a Republican. It doesn't matter. You're more concerned about your business, and they're concerned about uh, the next president, whomever that might be, as well as a deadlocked Congress. It's a tough thing going on right now. But we were broadcasting earlier this week in Scranton, Pennsylvania, from a small business which deals in office supplies and office furniture. And the guy who ran that company said to me, it doesn't make any difference who wins this election. The thing that matters is access to relatively cheap money and the market that we're operating in. Well, I would piggyback that uh, for most of our folks, they're not uh, bi they're bipartisan when it comes to who they're going to support in the long run. They're first of all employers, and I think one of the things people forget about small business and small employers is the uh, often very close and heavily um, weighted responsibility that they feel for their staff. So. Um, Small businesses create jobs, renew jobs based on sales. They like having credit to manage the gaps, but really it's knowing that they're going to be able to make sales. And I think one of the challenges to either party that wins is how do you mobilize the procurement power of government and incentivize the procurement power of larger corporations and universities and hospitals to think about and enable their procurement to extend more extensively to small business. Now, Bruce, let me ask you about a spat between the two candidates this week over business regulation. Uh, Barack Obama has accused Mitt Romney of supporting the kind of deregulation of business that caused this economic downturn in the first place. Where do you stand on that? Well, we're very concerned because they're, uh, they're, the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act was passed by Congress um, to correct some of the problems that caused the crisis. But there is a concern that it's going too far. For example, there are 8,000 community banks in America. They had nothing to do with causing the financial crisis, yet some of these new rules are applying to those smaller institutions. In a lot of ways, they're the backbone of the economy, um, lending to small businesses which generate all the jobs that we've been talking about. And they're facing these new draconian rules and regulations, and some of them might have different 
difficult time surviving because the cost of business is going sky high. And if some of them are forced into merging out of existence, that can't be good for consumers. Or pricing, you know, it, it boils down to that. It's unintended consequences that we're worried about. And I was wandering around downtown Boston yesterday and one bank had a big sign in its window said 170 years in business, no bailouts needed. And clearly some of the smaller banks feel a bit affronted there, yes. thrown in with the rest. Yes, because we get, we've seen so much media coverage that um, um, just really um, is, is so negative. Um, primarily, though, that the problems were caused by unscrupulous mortgage companies, non-banks, and big Wall Street firms. So all these small bankers are getting hit with all, all this reputation damage, and they're saying, we don't deserve it. You know, we, we, we managed our risk well. There was only one uh, bank failure in all of New England throughout the financial crisis. Now, Gene, explain something which I know a lot of our viewers have picked up on, the fact that both Romney and Obama seem continually focused on small business and middle classes. What about all of the other voters? How do you explain to people around the world that there is this preoccupation with a certain slice of U.S. society? Well, I think uh, what I said earlier is uh, there's all kinds of research that shows that American small business is the net job creator in the country. I think there's a larger issue which is reflective in what was just said and also in both of the parties' policies. In the United States, big knows how to work with big. We're really good at big with big. But there's a new big on the block, which I don't think either corporations or public policy has got their head around, which is the small, smart, connected networks that are predominantly local and regional of community banks, of small businesses, of local supply chains. And so this old big has got to figure out how does it work with the new big, and I don't know it has the right learning partners. I think there's a bit of a learning disability in both parties about that changing dynamic in our economy. Now, clearly, World Have Your Say isn't a scientific polling operation, but in my two weeks in America, I've been struck by the number of people who haven't decided who are impressed by Mitt Romney as a businessman. Doesn't mean they'll necessarily vote for him, but they like that about him. Do you think that is one of his big pluses when he uh, tries to persuade Americans to vote for him? Well, Bill Clinton said it best, I think, when he said, you can't love jobs and hate business. And I think even if Barack Obama gets elected, he too is going to have to move over and do something new and different to court business. If he wants his legacy to be that he was a job creator and he improved this economy, he's going to have to reach out to business, and large just, and small. Just a quick word from Eugene. Um, I'm not sure it's the president uh, of either party that's going to decide this one. There are two committees, the House Small Business Committee and the Senate Small Business Committee. And there's a very successful uh, small business administration program called Emerging Leaders. Both parties, both committees need to get off their certain part of their right. uh, anatomy and support that. that Gene and Bruce, thank you very much indeed. I saw The Economist magazine saying Barack Obama needs to do more to prove he's pro-business. I wonder if those of you watching in America and elsewhere agree. You're welcome to get involved at facebook.com slash world have your say. We'll speak to you in a couple of minutes time. <laughs> Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Well, just before the news, we were talking about the focus on small business in this election. Samantha's watching in South Africa. Hi there, Samantha. She's just tweeted to say, you can never be too focused on small business. It would be a problem if you were focusing on big business. Also, uh, lots of comment coming in from Africa. We've just had a call from Somalia, from Nigeria. And several Kenyans have got in touch to say they believe Barack Obama deserves another term. But my question to those of you in Kenya would be this. I remember standing uh, in front uh, of Barack Obama being inaugurated as president uh, four Januarys ago, and I was deluged by calls from Kenyans saying they were so excited about what he would do for East Africa. I wonder four years in whether he's met those expectations. By all means, get in touch through the phone number and the text number that you see on the screen. But I suppose as we're talking about these two men, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, we should actually see what they are being up to today. Barack Obama's been in Ohio, perhaps the most crucial swing state of them all. At the moment, though, Mitt Romney is in Wisconsin addressing a crowd. Let's see what he's saying. Because he admits that he'll stay on the same path he's been on. And the same course we have been on will not lead to a better destination. And you, you know this. The same path we're on means $20 trillion in debt in four years. 
It means crippling unemployment continues. It means stagnant take-home pay, depressed home values, and a devastated military. And unless we change course, we may well be looking at another recession. The question of this election comes down to this. Do you want more of the same or do you want real change? And we bring real change. Candidate Obama promised change, but he couldn't deliver it. I promised change, but I have a record of achieving it. I built the business. I turned around another. I helped put an Olympics back on track. And with a Democrat legislature, I helped turn my state from deficit to surplus from job losses to job gains, from higher taxes to higher take-home pay. That's changed. Look, th this is why I'm running for president. I know how to change the course that the country's on, how to get us to a balanced budget, how to build jobs and help raise take-home pay. Accomplishing real change is something I don't just talk about, it's something I've done. And it's what I'm going to do when I'm President of the United States, with your help. Well, there's Mitt Romney using a classic challenger's argument. Choose me, I'll give you something different and something better. It worked for Barack Obama four years ago. We'll have to wait until late on Tuesday night to see if it works for Governor Romney and both men are spending an awful lot of time in Ohio. It's perhaps the most crucial swing state. Let's bring in Paul Bellamy. He's director of the Cuyahoga County Foreclosure Prevention Program. He's joining us live from Cleveland, a city that World Have Your Say Hello. knows well. And Paul, hi there. I wonder if you and all people in Ohio are enjoying all of this attention you're getting. Not really. Um, I was just saying that people seem to think that if we're from a battleground state, someone's paying attention to what's bothering us, what we care about. And in fact, it seems to be almost the opposite. All the money comes in, they frame the issues, we get pushed to the side. And Paul, what do you want to hear from both of the candidates? I was driving around Cleveland just a couple of weeks ago and some houses are sitting empty, others are in a terrible state of repair. What could help rectify the housing situation in your part of the state? Probably the biggest issue for us is how many people owe more money on their mortgage than the home is worth. And I don't mean by a little. Uh, Cuyahoga County is about 36% underwater, and some of the neighborhoods are over 50%. And until we get some sort of restructuring of those mortgages, we can't move forward as a city. Now, you've talked about the abandoned homes and the vacant homes. It's a huge problem, but as long as the mortgage situation is out of control, that's just going to get worse. And we can't get either candidate to give us a specific program or commitment. But, Paul, explain to our viewers around the world why, if someone takes a chance on buying a property, they may make a great deal of money, but, of course, the flip side is they may lose money. Isn't that the nature of business? Why? Do these people deserve help? Yeah, first of all, uh, that idea of speculating on property never was current in Ohio. Now, that was something that we know people were doing in California and Florida and what were considered the hot real estate markets. But in Ohio, there's only been a steady appreciation of property and not a very remarkable one. So this idea of taking a risk with property, that's not what people were thinking about when they took out these loans, unless they were an investor. But if you're just a homeowner, you didn't see this as a risky proposition. And I can assure you the banks didn't either, or they wouldn't have lent the money. So this whole situation falls outside of what most people in America understand to be the, the rules of home ownership. Paul, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Cleveland. We appreciate it. And when we were in Ohio with World Have Your Say, if you were tuning uh, to almost any radio station, there would be ad after ad after ad 
about this election. Here in Massachusetts, though, a state which is very likely to go for Obama, turn on the radio and you're much, much less likely to hear those ads. Well, I was mentioning that we're not just broadcasting for an hour right now here on BBC World News. We've also got a special edition of World Have Your Say in just under eight and a half hours' time. Also live here on the BBC, and it's going to be taking place in an extraordinary building called the Old South Meeting House. This is a place with a history that goes back several centuries. And I've been speaking to Robin de Blossi, who works here, about the place which will be hosting World Have Your Say later on. So, Robin, take me right back to the beginning and tell me the, the first parts of the history of this hall. Sure. Old South Meeting House was built in 1729 as a Puritan meeting house. There was a congregation that gathered here in 1669, but they had um, overflowed their building. They needed to build a new structure. They built this building in 1729 using Anglican architecture for the exterior and Puritan architecture for the interior. And I was noting on one of the engravings up there that there's a mention of the British and their role in this city and in this hall. Yes, the World Have Your Say event will not be the first time the British have occupied the building. Actually, after the American Revolution, the building was punished for our role in the Boston Tea Party. The British came in, they gutted the interior, and they brought their horses in and used it as a stable and a riding school for a full year. I promise we're going to be a bit better behaved than that. And up here we've got this absolutely beautiful pulpit. I'm not going to be using it uh, on today's edition of World Have Your Say, nor will any of our guests, but I'm sure you've had some incredible speakers here over the years. We really have. Um, the building has been used for civic events and programs throughout our history from the early years as a Puritan church through the American Revolution and then into our free speech history into the 1920s and on. So we've had historical figures throughout those periods, everyone from Sam Adams and Dr. Joseph Warren up into our later history having Oliver Wendell Holmes and uh, Wendell Phillips. And I was reading about these lovely displays over here and I was reading on one of them that in the 1910s and 1920s there used to be regular political discussions here and that sometimes things could get a little heated and a little out of hand. Yes. In the 1920s in Boston, there were a number of political topics that were being censored from public buildings. And Old South Meeting House had to make a decision about what our role was going to be in allowing controversial topics to be discussed. We decided that it was in the spirit of our revolutionary history to continue to make the space available for civic dialogue and debate. So in 1929, we set that policy that we would allow speakers regardless of the popularity or unpopularity of their cause. As such, we've had controversial speakers on all sorts of political parties, um, social issues such as uh, racial issues and, and things like sexual health um, have been discussed from the pulpit here and into our modern day everything from debates on political ca uh, characters and elections to issues on the environment and policy. So no subjects are off limits for World Have Your Say? No subjects are off limits. We encourage all of it. Thank you Robin. And we're very, very excited about our later edition of World Have You Say, live here from the Old South Meeting House. Now, out on the streets of Boston, which is where I'm speaking to you from now, I've been joined by three more guests who are going to be joining us here on World Have Your Say in a couple of minutes' time. I'm very keen to ask them, and I'll ask you as well, whether you were impressed by the standard of political discourse that we've seen during this campaign. We'll get into that after a couple of minutes' break. Hi, this is Ros Atkins. Welcome back to World Have Your Say out on the sidewalk in downtown Boston. Let me introduce you to the three guests who are joining me now. We have Jody Beggs, an economics blogger and also a teacher at Northeastern University. Nice to see you, Jody. We've also got Michelle McPhee, who, well, I was looking through all the things you do, Michelle, and it's just about everything. Author, talk show host, journalist, columnist. Thank you very much for coming along. And last but not least, Professor Kay Schlossman from Boston College. Good to see you all three of you. Um, let's talk about the political discourse in the US. Have you been impressed by the tone and the standard of this campaign? Well, uh, this isn't the first campaign that they've got nasty. If you want to look for a precedent for nasty campaigns, go to the late 19th century when they were accusing uh, Grover Cleveland of having fathered an illegitimate child. Pa, ma, ma, where's my pa? Down in the White House. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> so we should just expect this. This is part of politics. This happens in the United States. 
It does get ugly, but it's ironic that we're standing right here in the birthplace of this country, where it was about the country and not about party politics, and now everything's about party politics, and, it's, and the discourse has become so ugly that it is the absolute antithesis of what Barack Obama campaigned on and what catapulted him into the White House. He said, we are going to be about not red states, blue states, we're going to be about America. And then that never came to fruition, and I think that's why this election is so down to the wire and exciting right now. I think the level of discourse is, in general, somewhat subpar, but I think there is hope, because when you see speeches by people like Bill Clinton, who essentially went out and gave 45 minutes of numbers and statistics, mm -hmm. he was able to do so in a way that actively engaged people. Like, people want that information, and I think that the people that are doing the political talking underestimate what people want to hear in a lot of cases. And but they hold really on, like he's the former president. Shouldn't that be coming from the president? He's the one who did this four years ago. Why this change of tack? I'm not sure. I think to some degree it's much easier to run on this is what I would like to do, whereas Barack Obama is now limited in running on this is what I have done. Because we haven't seen from Mitt Romney what he would actually do as president, so we have to take him on his word about his future plans, which don't have the same limitations in terms of getting everyone to work together, getting things passed in Congress, etc. But Bill Clinton the is, the, is the voice of, of the economy because the economy was actually flourishing under Bill Clinton. And under Barack Obama, it was a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the economy's at a stalemate, unemployment remains abysmal, and there weren't any real results to point to that the president can point to. Well, hold on, unemployment is at its lowest level for years. The Consumer Confidence Index, which was out recently, is at its highest point for five years. Unemployment's below 8%. These are good signs of progress, no? What I was going to say in response to is Obama campaigning differently. It's the privilege of the challenger to say, I'm going to make things better and here we've got hope. And when you're the incumbent, and you're an incumbent who had a lot of trouble getting the opposite party to play ball, that is something that is somewhat different in American politics, the extent to which the parties won't talk to one another. And um, though there's blame to go around, uh, a new analysis by a Republican and Democrat says the blame lies a little more with the Republicans than it does with the Democrats. And over, over the past couple of days, we've been gathering questions for our audience who will gather here mm -hmm. in Boston in a few hours' time. And one that's coming out quite a lot is whether you feel proud of the democracy that you're showing to the world. Is this the best? Is this what the world should try and copy? I think that, you know, the old quote of, you know, democracy may not be perfect, but it's better than anything else we've tried. I think no system is going to be perfect, but at least we have, to some degree, a system where people are able to put out their policies, and then, you know, we do really have a one vote, you know, one person system, and I hope that we don't start seeing that turn more into a one dollar one vote system. But well, there I was are reading definitely that twenty dollars per yeah. voter is being spent. But the point is the turnout in America is quite low, isn't it? Compared with say Western Europe. Um, that's an old tradition and there are a lot of explanations. One of them is that in most Western European countries and in other democracies around the world, uh, the government takes responsibility for registering voters, which doesn't happen in the United States. Another thing is in general the parties take a uh, um, more responsibility for getting out the vote in other places than they do in the United States. So it is disappointing that the United States has relatively low turnout, though it's gone up since the mid-90s. And I also believe the president is paying the price for a Congress that has failed to pass a budget for three years straight. And there is so much uh, negativity that swirls, like the, the public's opinion of Congress right now and the process is so low well, that Barack Obama is paying the price for that. They can't get anything done. And that's been very striking as well, obviously, has traveled around the country. People believe in Americans' ability to change things. Their belief in Washington being able to change things seems to be at an all-time low. Right here in Massachusetts, we had leaders that were able to do that. We had the the great Tip O'Neill, who made the famous quote, all politics is local. We had Ted Kennedy, who was very able to go across the aisle, and that doesn't exist. There's nobody out there in either party that is willing to work with the other team. Michelle, Kay, and Jody, thank you very much indeed. Thanks to all of you for taking part around the world. We're going to be back in just over eight hours' time for a special edition of World Have Your Say, live from the Old South Meeting House in Boston. Try and make it if you can. Goodbye. <laughs>